Welcome to the Contemplative Life. Three pastors, friends, and spiritual companions help us explore spirituality through a contemplative lens. I'm Christina Roberts. I'm Chris Roberts. I'm Christina Kaiser. We're glad you joined us. Hello, it's great to be with you. Today, we are talking about living a life of meaning, living into our meaning. And I recently had this topic come up for me again as I was engaging with the work of a woman named Emily Esfahani Smith. And so if you are interested in her, we'll put some information in the description. She has a book called The Power of Meaning. She has a TED Talk called There's More to Life Than Being Happy. And that's actually the thing that caught me was this notion that what she was talking about was that happiness is not as important as meaning. In fact, it's the other way around. Life needs meaning more than it needs happiness. We need a reason to get out of bed. We need a sense of purpose. And so I thought we might start there because I can track with her just fine, but it is so shocking to hear that these things might be ordered, that somehow happiness is lower than meaning in some way. I mean, I think this is such a relevant topic with just what's going on globally in our world. And I think that the pandemic, you know, I, we had referenced a different podcast about the great resignation. And I think back in April, the millions of people quitting their job. And even like just this week, I was reading some more articles about how people are unsatisfied and not wanting to go back to their works and really thinking about the meaning of life in light of the pandemic. And so I think for sure that this is relevant in the sense of, and and I wonder if generationally speaking, I think a lot of times the message that boomer parents gave to their children was, I just want you to be happy, right? That's that sort of the end all be all is I want you to be happy. And yet it seems like younger generations, of course we want that. I'm not saying that we don't, but there is something like we want our, our life to impact, have meaning like you're talking about, um, make a difference in the world. <clears throat> Some of these different phraseologies that I think really matter to us. And so I think that's why if I'm unsatisfied with my job, I I don't have to keep doing this, or maybe I want to go back to school to get some new training, or I'm going to backpack and explore what's out there. And so I I think definitely it's been heightened in my opinion through the pandemic and post-pandemic. That is a totally great point. And even as you're talking, it's causing me to reflect on, yes, there's these numerous moments in life where I'll kind of sit back and and ask, is this it? Is this what I thought would happen when I went on this particular path? Uh, Is this scratching the itch of of what I want in my life? So, and even I'm thinking too of Richard Rohr's notion of first half of life, second half of life, right? We build a container, which probably does focus a lot on our happiness. (laughs) Does this thing bring me joy and make me feel happy? Uh, But his big emphasis there is that the second half of life is really more about finding meaning and what is it all about and all that stuff that I was fighting for, maybe it takes a back seat, maybe it's not as important as something else in my life. So what you're saying is bringing, it's ringing a lot of bells. (laughs) Belonging is something that we achieve or should achieve early on in our lives, right? We belong to a family unit and there's this, this sense of connectedness to, to one's, you know, own family. And then as we get older, you know, I think purpose becomes, uh, we leave sort of that, that family unit and we set out on journey to, to figure out, you know, what, what is our purpose in life? And uh, I, I see the order that, that, that this could uh, take shape in one's life. And one of my late night conversations that I mentioned in a previous podcast with one of my daughters, uh, you know, we were talking about this idea of purpose and, you know, she was, she was bringing up, there's so many people that are doing things that aren't their purpose, that they're uniquely created to do. And she was talking about doctors being, being doctors for the money instead of to help bring healing to people's lives that, you know, the purpose of being a doctor is to, to, to be a healer. And uh, I thought, wow, man, she's, she's getting it at such an, a, an early age. And I was just delighted with our conversation that maybe this generation that's coming up is starting to look at purpose uh, sooner than previous generations. Yeah. It's interesting that you're citing 
um, those two things, because in this TED talk, she names these four pillars, which apparently also come up in the book, and I haven't read the book. Uh, but in that TED talk, she says, like, in order to have this life of meaning, a person needs a sense of belonging. And it doesn't matter, like, you might get that in the spiritual community, you might get that at work, you might get that in your family, that might change, right? But, but you need belonging, you need purpose. Uh, you need storytelling and you need this thing she calls transcendence which loosely i would translate to spiritual connection spiritual experience transcendence feels like too grand of a word for me <laughs> but yeah she lists these four things belonging purpose storytelling and transcendence and i wonder even in the the ex example of the doctor is it possible that we do start initially for the money and then as time goes on the money is right we we become that's our norm that's what we're used to it happened we we have security and now maybe we do look to meaning even if we started with a different motive or maybe they start out in a medical profession and then they realize like that is not where i find meaning and there's a total about face that happens later on in life yeah, you know something that i've been in conversations with this past week is i think sometimes we can put so much anxiety and stress around finding my meeting, finding my purpose. What is it? And it's like this big puzzle that we have to figure out with God. And what would it look like instead to, you know, in the day-to-day, -day, like, what is my purpose for today? Or what's the meaning that I can find today? Kind of breaking it down into a little bit more of ordinary life versus like these grandiose, I have to, you know, find this big thing. And so even, you know, um, studies that talk about longe longevity of life and um, there's a community, I want to say in Japan. I could be wrong about that, but, you know, essentially like part of their meaning and purpose is cultivating gardens and having conversation with one another and elderly communities, you know, again, the purpose doesn't have to be, I'm like going out and curing cancer. That's awesome. If that's part of your, you know, job description, but also like cultivating this garden plot and sharing vegetable soup with the neighbor and having conversation for an hour. That is also part of that. So I think that's what you're talking about as well, Chris, that belonging and purpose kind of going in together and telling the stories. Like there's something about that, that is sort of like, um, fuel in our tank, if you will, and, um, connects us to the, the greater, again, there's our life, but then that greater meaning of life as just being a human on planet earth. Yeah. I really like what you're saying about life in the ordinary. And I've been listening to Alan Watts recently was a proponent of some of the things that we're talking about looking for life in the ordinary, you know, like the ordinary day-to-day -day life. He says, you know, we're always looking for life to happen in the next culmination of experiences that we're going to have. And if you don't look to the now, you're going to, you're going to miss life entirely because if you're looking for that next moment, to achieve this thing of transcendence or, or however you want this spiritual connection or experience, you're going to miss what's actually happening in your life. Now, I really think that this conversation is super important to many, many people out there. Yeah. And I think even, you know, earlier that this idea of happiness and meaning, you know, I think definitely there are times when I may be setting aside the emotion of happiness for a meaningful moment. And so, you know, my son's really into curious George books right now. I've read enough Curious George. Like it doesn't make me happy to sit down and read again about George discovering whatever it is that George is going to get into. And yet I, I set that aside because this is joyful for my son. And there's something beautiful about connecting over the story of this curious monkey with my kid on the couch. And he's delighting in these discoveries. And so, you know, even that notion earlier about their meeting is greater than happiness. I think for sure that's the case. If I was all about my happiness, I would not be doing that. But I think sometimes we set that aside for a greater thing. Again, that's a small example, but I think that it definitely rings true for me. I super appreciate what you're saying. So I was just talking yesterday. Uh, I wonder if I lose meaning, uh, even as we're having this conversation, there's a couple of things connecting. Do I lose meaning because I was really focused on my suffering, right? So happiness and suffering is probably where it all gets. So we're just trying to get out of suffering probably. So it's probably why we even settle on, I just want to be happy, you know, but I was saying in terms of your daily sufferings are there's minuscule and small, but it is what it is. So yesterday my suffering is being up too many times in the night because this one's coughing and the cat starts yelling and whatever, and now it's morning. And so and now I've got to go through this whole day and I feel really exhausted. And how am I just going to enjoy this moment? And somebody said something 
about, you know, it's maybe it's just looking at this moment right now, sort of like what you're saying with the Curious George book, like, look, I'm with my son and look how cute he is and his eyes and his smiling face. And isn't it so wonderful? Uh, now, when I just think about that as a exercise, like, yes, I should in the future enjoy looking into my child's eyes. It, I don't got anything that that it does not feel fulfilling unless I am actually living it, I think, is the reality. Um, but it's bringing it all up and how they even can tie together. Where's my belong? Well, I've got this family. I belong <laughs> in this family. That is for sure. My purpose is what? Like, is my purpose to read to my child in order to get them to learn how to read? Is it to be with my, but there is purpose as we sit there and we're sitting with them. And then I get to tell the story, but right? so it's just unfolding and I'm actually discovering the meaning as it happens, I think. Yeah, and I like that you bring up that life is not just happiness, it's suffering. I think it was the Buddha that said, life is 10,000 joys and 10,000 sufferings. We, sh we experience them in equal amounts. I, I think you bring up a good point that suffering is, is a part of life as well as happiness. And happiness, again, is just one emotion in a, like a swath of so many emotions. And I think we've talked about this before, right? Like these, you know, feelings wheels, emotion wheels that often in contemplative circles, we use as tools to help identify more emotions. And so I don't like that would to me be a non-diverse, boring life. Actually, if I was happy all the time, that doesn't even sound appealing to me where, you know, um, being curious, being um, interesting, all the things, right. I, I think really make a, a well-rounded, robust life. And I think for me personally, I would rather experience all the emotions than just be limited to happy. That feels kind of I don't know, small to me. That is a very helpful point that happiness is actually an emotion and meaning is something beyond emotion, which can, we can look for it. We can have these various ways, but I, and I do appreciate the storytelling thing, especially as I am in the middle of life. There's enough life lived to want to say, what was the meaning? <laughs> what happened here? Where are we going with this? What's the meaning and purpose behind it? Um, so in that sense, even I appreciate the notion of spiritual companioning it, it, a time set aside where I can tell my story. Someone can reflect my story back to me. Very useful tool in the midst of trying to discover meaning. Yeah. And I've heard uh, the term spiritual companioning. The actual definition is listening someone to awareness of their own story. So I really I like that definition to help us look at how, how do we connect with our own story? I think it takes somebody listening to us, listening to the themes that come across and saying, hey, I, I noticed this kernel. It's in connectedness that we experience belonging to our own story. So I like that point that you brought up, Christina. Yeah. And just recently I was um, in a spiritual companioning session. I was the recipient and I was actually experiencing a happy, joyful moment and trying to find meaning in that and not having to find a problem to solve or to fix or, and I think the person who was companioning me in that moment, it was a peer of mine. She was like, I didn't know what to do because I'm so used to the suffering, the problem and, and working through. And so it was like this beautiful exchange we had of like, no, we can actually soak in the gratitude of this and find meaning in the happiness rather than just let that pass us by as well. So I, I really appreciate that meaning making in the contemplative tying in with stories. And again, that word transcendent, I think we're all thinking that's a really big word, but again, I think that those experiences and, and the meaning and the connection can happen all the time, day to day in our lives. I think so too. And I've really appreciated uh, people lately who have called to my attention, this notion of if you really want that interior world, you want to have a sense of like, where is God? Explore your exterior world or explore what's going on because God is in your world. And so that sense of transcendence is in these things that we're talking about, which I really appreciate as a way just to make it real and accessible. Well, thank you guys. This is a great conversation. I appreciate being able to process some of it. There's a lot of meaningful nuggets that I want to take with me into my day. Now is the time in our podcast where we take a moment to talk about what we are into. What are we into today? 
Well, I am into travel plans. And so um, our family will be traveling down south to Texas here coming up soon. And my husband and I will be celebrating our 21st anniversary. And so that is a very fun, happy occasion. And so we are looking into making some plans while we were down there to get away. So that is what I am into. Yeah, I feel like I should probably be into that as well. And I'll just state that I am into that theoretically, but uh, on a more practical and tangible level, uh, just to prove that you're not the only sci-fi fan out there, Christina Kaiser, I have been into Stargate, uh, which happens to have a theme that we've been talking about, this transcendence notion. Stargate SG-1 is is this sci-fi where people travel through these gates and that there's this ancient civilization that's left behind these gates and everybody's wondering what's happened to them. And these ancients apparently have ascended. They are like no longer matter. You know, they don't have bodies They're They're, they are in the, uh, the realm of, of of being that transcends uh, body and matter. So I have been into Stargate SG-1. So you're not the only sci-fi geek out there. Well, that is exciting. I haven't even seen that. So I'll have to check in with my husband and see if I can like catch up. Uh, And happy anniversary in the near future-ish. So yay, that's exciting. I am not into anything super deep, but as it turns out, I needed a way to deal with uh, hard water for my hair. And so the salon that I go to suggested a shampoo called Undo Goo by Malibu. And so <laughs> it smells lovely. It's very citrusy and it is getting the gunk out of my hair so that it does what it's supposed to. And that is what it means to have a day to day life is to just be excited about shampoo. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us today. If you are looking to go deeper into your spiritual journey, we do invite you to check out the spiritual direction page on our website. There's all kinds of practical information there about spiritual direction and companioning. And until next time, make it a great week. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.